Hi, good morning, everyone, uh, and welcome to our session. Thank you so much for being here. Um, my, my name is Kamal Jathwani. I am the Corporate Manager for Research and Innovation at the Center for Connected Health. And, and my role really is to uh, think about how to solve major problems in delivery of care today and then how to prove their efficacy and how to help scale them. Which is why I thought today's panel, for me especially, is very interesting, um, is to think about, you know, we've heard so much about in the last two days about why telehealth is so interesting and so important and, and you know, it's the need of the hour, but still we only see pilots and clinical trials. We don't really see anything at scale. And I'm, we're going to try to uncover a little bit about that today. We have a very esteemed panel of, of moder uh, panelists today, and I'm going to let them introduce themselves. Um, we're going to start uh, with Rajni. Good morning, everyone. My name is Dr. Rajni Anesha. I'm the Strategic Executive Clinical Transformation Leader with Humana. Very interesting, what does it mean? Um, so I'm responsible for clinical innovations across the organization, and we look at different technologies, different ways how we can improve patient care, access to care, delivery to care, and certainly uh, on the, in the end, uh, improving outcomes. So I think as the panel goes today, uh, we'll talk about the interesting things you were doing at Humana, piloting, experimenting, and few things that we have done for our employees. So you will get an employer prospect, but also a perspective from a managed care company. Very delighted to be here today. I will say one more thing. Uh, we look very color coordinated. We really planned this. <laughs> so never happened to me, but I think some plannings go well. So thank you. Thank you. Uh, I'm Margaret Laws. I'm the director of the Innovations for the Underserved Program of the California Healthcare Foundation. So again, following Raj, I have to tell you what that means. Um, California Healthcare Foundation is a private nonprofit foundation. We work to improve uh, healthcare quality, access, and cost uh, for the people of California. In the Innovations for the Underserved program, our goal is to bring innovation in healthcare service and healthcare technology to low income populations. Uh, so we focus on uh, both understanding what the uh, providers who serve low-income populations need the Medicaid managed care plans, the hospitals, community hospitals, public hospitals, community health centers, and also keeping abreast of what's going on in the world of innovation in early stage companies, uh, later stage companies in healthcare technology and healthcare services, and then try to bring them together uh, and really bring them together with the goal of scaling improved access and affordability um, for the population of California. Um, at CHCF, I do both a grants program. Uh, we're lucky enough to work with Kamal and uh, his uh, colleagues at the Center for Connected Health, and also run what's called the CHCF Health Innovation Fund, which is a social investment fund, a program-related investment fund that uh, works to invest in early stage uh, companies and bring them into safety net providers in California. So I'll be talking a little bit more about some of those specific examples later on. Um, also very happy to be here and look forward to the panel. Great. Hi, my name is Sri Chagatura. I'm a physician at Mass General. I'm also medical director for Population Health Management at Partners Healthcare. And about a year and a half ago, when we signed at Partners Healthcare a number of contracts that asked us to provide care in a non fee for service manner in a population health or an accountable care contract, we decided to create a centralized department that would help coordinate and support the activities required for us to be successful at, this, at these at-risk contracts. And within that group, I'm the medical director overseeing that transformation in clinical delivery. As part of my responsibilities, I am overseeing the Pioneer Accountable Care Organization, our, our contract with Medicare. Uh, we have 65,000 lives in the Pioneer ACO, but we have a majority of our uh, contracted patients in risk outside of Pioneer with commercial risk, with Blue Cross Blue Shield and with Medicaid. Uh, we also have a large self-insured population. Partners Healthcare is the largest employer in the state after the government. We have 60,000 employees with 100,000 employees and dependents who receive their benefits through Partners Healthcare. So I'm the medical director overseeing the self-insured population. And then lastly, I'm helping to oversee our strategic development and implementation of population health IT. So what is all the technology that we're going to be uh, needing to help make this transition from fee-for-service to, to population health? So I hope to bring to uh, bear on this panel the perspectives of both the provider 
as an as a institution that's transitioning away from fee-for-service, but also as an employer trying to think through how could we provide these technologies for our employees' independence. Good morning. I'm David Lindemann, and I'm actually wearing two hats here today. Uh, first, I'm the director for the Center for Technology and Aging based in California, which has focused on looking at this problem, re remote patient monitoring plus other technologies to improve the well-being quality of life for older adults, particularly through programs that can be scaled. We were responsible in that project in, a, in our center to run a number of different pilots in this area, speaking to the subject today. We supported over 20 some initiatives to look at how we can scale different programs uh, working around remote monitoring and other types of uh, direct services. And again, we're in, focused in that area on looking at new innovative solutions to technology-enabled uh, programs for, to support older adults. But I also am now co-director for the CITRUS, which is the Center for Information Technology Research in the Interests of Society, a very <laughs> modest uh, title, um, at, at the University of California. We are a four-campus uh, special group that's been in existence for 12 years, focused on improving technology solutions that not only to create new companies but to improve societal issues ranging from energy to intelligent infrastructure and to our own group in healthcare. And in healthcare we have uh, a large team of researchers and work across campuses, UC Berkeley, UC um, uh, Davis, UC Merced, UC Santa Cruz, and bringing together many different disciplines, uh, primarily engineering but also in our case, uh, medicine, nursing, public health, et cetera, all around coming up with the, uh, new solutions in this space. We run both uh, an incubator, seed grants, as well as large initiatives that are focused primarily on looking at chronic disease issues and improving uh, service delivery systems. And again, our goal there is to look at large healthcare problems and to see how we can influence uh, new directions in the way we serve uh, not just older adults, but complex chronic individuals as well. Great, thank you for that. Um, so I'm gonna start with you, Rajni, and, and you know, my, my question to you is to sort of just comment a little bit about the opportunities you see in, in remote monitoring, specifically within telehealth, and, and we're really interested in hearing your perspective both as a plan and as a managed care company. Sure, um, so I think I'm, I'm gonna give or highlight two different examples. I think, uh, Humana is very focused on uh, senior population. I mean, we do have commercial segment, but uh, when we talk about senior population and providing care to them, access to them, and it's meeting the patients where they are, so engagement becomes a very big um, priority for us. And how do we keep people in touch or patients in touch with their medical conditions, their functional status at home, and we are monitoring it, but we're also keeping them healthy. So one of the things that we're doing uh, is a pilot that we recently started. It's for nine months. We're going to do it with AMC. Is around remote congestive heart failure uh, monitoring programs where we'll collect the biometrics and um, AMC will do this part, but then they will do it in collaboration with Humana Cares, which is our um, chronic care management company. And, and the goal behind this is certainly we want to not only focus on the clinical aspect of a member, but also the functional aspect of the member and, and provide the care in a very holistic manner and not have them feel that you're only gonna see your physician like three or four or maybe six or seven times a year, but provide that ongoing continuous uh, communication channel through variety of technology, through having an outreach by a nurse or having even a person go to your home and, act, and just evaluate uh, how you're living and uh, what you're eating and uh, are you able to, um, to be very functional within your home? Is that safe environment? So I think all of this is component of this program and we're very excited that we're gonna see how this, um, the outcomes are gonna be, but I think the partnership is very promising. So that's one aspect from a plan standpoint, but one of the other things um, we are doing, which is very progressive from an employer standpoint, is um, we re recently uh, actually launched our telemedicine clinic within uh, our headquarters, which is very um, interesting. So we, we can go downstairs, and sometimes I go to Louisville, which where is our headquarters. We have 11,000 uh, employees working there. And one of the things we're like, 
how do we make our employees' life better and, and provide care to them when they are not request, uh, when they don't have to take off from, uh, from work, but it's just some issue that they think they can get taken care of. So we developed and created and, and launched this telemedicine suite within our main headquarter building. People can just go downstairs. Um, it looks like a doctor's office. Everything is there uh, from an uh, equipment standpoint. Um, the only thing is that your physician is probably not there and is remote, and you are connecting with them through video conferencing. And for minor ailments or acute issues, uh, you can get care right then and there. You, you will probably have uh, another option to engage. And so we look at it from providing extra healthcare capabilities and access to mm -hmm. not only our members, but to also our employees. And I think that, in the end, uh, we feel will help us reduce the healthcare costs, but also improve outcomes from mm -hmm. a chronic condition standpoint. Great. Um, moving on to uh, Margaret. Margaret, talk a little bit about the challenges you see in, in scaling. Sure. Um, so uh, I'll start, actually, with a section on uh, challenges and barriers. I'll start with what their incredible opportunities there are right now. And I think one of the things we think about a lot at the moment we are in in history is with the ACA c coming to be and an, a lot of new patients coming into the system, particularly coming into the, the safety net healthcare system, I think there's a uh, real increased awareness for the need to have um, much better access and much more um, affordable access for people at scale. So I think while we've got some real challenges that I'll outline, this is an opportunity to actually bring technology to bear to help uh, meet some of them. So I, th I try to divide it into to three categories. The first one is a payment or a reimbursement challenge. And just to use Don Berwick's example, from this morning, we're really moving from a system where you're, you're paid to have a patient in a bed or a person at a clinic, um, and we need to move to a system where you're actually paid to keep people out of beds and to, and to be, deliver care uh, where people need it and deliver the care that will keep them from having to present at the emergency room or have an inpatient stay. So that shift in the payment and reimbursement um, scheme, I think, is a really important one for the adoption of technologies and care models that serve people at home, where they work, uh, and in the community. The second is, a, is workflow. And I think one of the biggest challenges we've had working with community health centers and clinics, working with hospitals, all kinds of healthcare providers, is helping people take on the challenge of incorporating these tools and technologies into their workflow, thinking about how the data gets from whatever device and capture mechanism we have into the electronic record. Um, they're really not insignificant challenges and I think a really important part of, um, of getting to scale. And the third one is, is what I'll call user interface or usability. So, uh, you know, we talk a lot, I thought uh, Dr. Pidar's discussion about the smartphone as a platform for delivering health information and care was a really important one. But the user interface and the usability for senior populations, in Rajni's case, for low-income populations or non-English speaking populations in a lot of the work that we do, really being thoughtful as we develop or, or work with people to develop these products and services about having these be um, usable, intuitive, um, and, and not run into the people won't press a button challenge that Dr. Kvidar talked about this morning. And I'm going to throw in one more we didn't talk about uh, in, when, we, uh, when we initially talked about the, the challenges uh, for, for this panel, and that's evidence. And it's uh, really thinking about how as we run pilots like the one Rajni's doing, as we at the California Healthcare Foundation um, test new innovations with providers, how we produce the evidence that will help um, payers and providers take these innovations to scale. So payment and reimbursement, workflow, user interface, and usability and evidence, I think, are the challenges we need to take on as we think about how to bring these innovations to scale. Great. Um, and on sure. Uh, I think uh, uh, one of the reasons when, when people take on the telemedicine or telehealth, uh, a, a very big enterprise-wide initiatives, uh, you have to have a champion in in this organization to run this because that's the champion which is coordinating all these activities keeping the communication lines open and getting the buy-in uh, a lot of time um, my in my previous experience what i have seen is these initiatives get um, started with a lot of enthusiasm a lot of zest and and everybody's excited to get on board but if you really do not have a leader who can give you the direction and have the accountability 
um, these projects certainly um, don't go forward as you would expect. So I certainly see that as a challenge. I'm not yeah. sure you feel I think that that's way. That's the most important one, actually. So I'm glad you brought it up. I, I do want to get into evidence a little bit more, but but I want to give Sri and David a chance to uh, talk first. So Sri, um, you were, you, as you said, you're you're a provider and you're an employer, and those are very distinct, at least in in our minds. So talk a little bit about sort of those two perspectives um, and how that um, challenges scale or even implementation of these programs. Sure, uh, happy to do so. Um, you know, I think also as Margaret mm -hmm. said, the opportunity is relatively clear about connected health. Uh, both as a provider as an employer, we know that a majority of people live their life outside of the healthcare system. So if having that data will either help patients with self-management or secondly provide data to the people who can provide additional management services, the clinicians, the clinical teams, uh, and the care providers uh, to help manage, uh, improve outcomes. So l let's assume the payment system is there. Let's move, that, move beyond that. After the payment system is there, I think the challenge, let me first talk as an employer. The challenge as an employer is that one is uh, what I like to call a big brother problem. Uh, if you're an employer providing these remote monitoring sens uh, sensors, how do you make sure that it's done in a trusting and collaborative manner with your employees so that you're seen as a partnership in helping them improve their health care and that there is no uh, untoward or negative repercussions of having your uh, your data being monitored. So make sure you know what you're tracking, why, what are you doing with it, and you need to make that argument uh, to your employees. And after you cross over that big brother issue, then there is the question of what do you do with that data as an employer? What are your intervention arms that can help your employees actually improve their health care? And so you could use your clinical delivery unit, so employers might have their own EAP or occupational health uh, departments, and if they don't, then how do they give that information to the clinical providers, whether or not it's an outsourced stock health or EAP, or it's actually back to their providers, and then you get into the challenges of moving that information from one site to the other. So the challenges are the, the trust and then the interventions. Now let me talk a bit as a provider. As a provider, there's, I would say, a lot more challenges. So the first is patient selection. How do you identify for any technology uh, which population? For heart failure, uh, how, what is it? Ejection fraction less than 30, 40? Is it all patients? Uh, so figuring out how tight or broad you're going to have your patient population. And your ROI uh, changes based on that, as we know. The second is the patient support system. How are you going to get that technology into their house and help them to use it? It's providing a help desk support system. And as a provider, we don't necessarily have that built. So you're now talking about building uh, help desk support for technology that is not a core capability of what providers do. We're very good at creating, uh, delivering medicines, but tech support isn't necessarily in our wheelhouse. The third is the data capture, making sure that the patient is reliable in giving that data and that we're able to, uh, and that technology is usable. Uh, then the fourth is data transfer. How do you get that data from wherever you're monitoring back into your clinic? And then not only into the clinic, but as we move into population health management, we're finding that we're using a lot more technology than just e electronic medical records. So we have now patient registries. We have patient-reported outcome platforms. We have care management systems. And so you're going to have to parse that information and not only flow it into the EMR, but into these other systems and figure out, uh, which I think is the next problem, is the visualization problem, which Margaret talked about in the UI, of how do you take all of this uh, information and then make it usable to the clinicians who are making decisions or back to the uh, patient who needs to do self-management decisions. And then lastly is the workflow integration issues, which Margaret talked about, which are who's going to look at this data, when are they going to do it, and what are the triggers for an intervention. Uh, so in summary, it's selection, support systems, data capture, data transfer, visualization, workflow integration. So there's quite a number of challenges. That being said, the opportunity is there. Every technology, we have to ask ourselves these set of six questions, but uh, we are excited about this and continue to ask these whenever we see a promising technology. Great. Um, David, so um, we, you know, in your role as a, as a um, granting 
agency for so many years, you've seen a lot of success stories in this space, and you've seen a lot of these projects go to scale. And we'd be really interested in hearing about sort of your perspective on, on why they were successful and what these success stories were. Um, thank you, Kamal. Well, I, first, I would agree completely with my three colleagues. I think they've laid out the stage for what the, the key elements are that are important in terms of success. But I think it's important to step back and look at the issue that we do have uh, some significant programs that have demonstrated success. And one of the key issues we have is really dissemination of information. Because when we look at uh, some of the large players that particularly in um, a, with a controlled population or working at this, and you look at the Veterans Administration here in the U.S., you look at U.K., the NHS program, uh, that has been working in, uh, extraordinarily successfully, even though some of the evidence has not been conveyed properly. But when you dig down, you'll see that they have had multiple, multiple programs of success. And also our Canadian colleagues who are here uh, uh, at the conference, who particularly in Ontario have demonstrated again and again the success of this program. So it, it really is something that I think ultimately the information needs to be shared even more because we do have examples. And as you've said, Kamal, we've done these 22 plus demonstrations now working with many others of which uh, the majority were successful. We did see some failures, but of those 22 primary ones, over 10 went to scale. Not all were in RPM. But we did see that type of, of issue. And I think it's uh, important to really consider some of the, the underlying issues that are still out there on this macro scale that are, are barriers. Um, being, having champion, having um, alignment with reimbursement, having workflow issues, patient selection, et cetera, all very fundamental. Um, and we could go into more details in each one. But there are some issues that are still out there from a regulatory perspective that are barriers, particularly here in the U.S. where we cannot have uh, professionals working across state lines. And uh, I believe it was this week we see the new uh, uh, law being introduced. We'll see if it passes H.R. 3077 by Gratison that would allow professionals to work across state lines. Uh, some of the successful programs that we're seeing around the U.S. are programs that are very consolidated, use a, uh, can work across healthcare systems or work across providers, but use centralized uh, core service centers. And the key issue is if you are not able to work at scale ac across many different, across geographic areas, you're really constrained. So I think that there are a number of issues like that that are still the uh, barriers, even though we have uh, success after success uh, being shown in this area. And if I could, just one other point. I think what's central here is that we do see mixed results being published. Some, uh, every year uh, we seem to get success stories, either whether they're pilots or scalable, but also others that have not been successful. But what we don't see is enough discussion and digging down. Wendy Everett, who spoke yesterday, has been wonderful at, at really probing into the issues behind some of these studies. And often you'll see that there are constraints, like we saw, in the way the studies were designed, in the way the programs were established. Uh, they did not, for example, sync up with existing workflow processes, as, so that they did have barriers right out of the gate. So I think, um, going back to a central thesis, I think a great deal of this will be in being able to bring the key findings forward and uh, speaking to, to them and getting those uh, success stories disseminated properly. Great. Um, so my first question to the entire panel, and, and Margaret and David, both of you touched on evidence, right? So what evidence do we need to create? We're, we're seeing clinical trials, pilots, usability, satisfaction, a lot of things coming out. Uh, but what is really the evidence you think that will move us to scale right away? Uh, Margaret, can you, do you want to sure. start? Um, so it was interesting because the, the project that David just alluded to was one that we got involved with, with both Partners Center for Connected Health and Center for Technology and Aging. And it was a study of uh, remote monitoring for congestive heart failure. And when that, and it was, it actually was not a study, it was a pilot program. And when the pilot program was put in place, the, the pilot program paired um, a technology provider with a, with a health system and the pilots were going to run. And, and what was interesting about it, we were having a conversation about it and said, you know, there's no study 
looking at return on investment going along with these pilots. And it would be a real pity if these pilots all went on and at the end of them, because we have the systems involved and because we have the, the technology providers involved, if we came out of this pilot and didn't have return on investment information, because in a sense, that's how people are making decisions and that's how we see scale. A system sees the evidence that there has been a return on their investment both in patient outcomes and hopefully in, in cost savings. Um, and so I, I think there is, we do a lot of funding of pilots and a lot of funding of projects where we don't look at that element, and mm -hmm. I think that's an incredibly important element to scale. I think, it, you know, we think about this in California all the time. We think, wow, if we have a really successful program in one community health center, all the other community health centers will just start doing it. Well, that doesn't happen mm -hmm. for all sorts of reasons. But I think one of the most important reasons is because there isn't uh, any kind of an analysis of uh, work and money and time and effort in and mm -hmm. outcomes and uh, and re you know cost savings out and I think those are really important things to people who are running health systems and I think they're really crucial um, if we're going to see some of these really interesting pilots that take off in one or two or three places actually go to scale. Great. Um, David, can you share a little bit uh, with us about sort of the experience of working with these pilot sites on collecting ROI information and how that helped them or not. Do we have any more information on that? Sure, and um, I'd just like to first uh, say it's uh, been a delight working with Kamal and his team on this return on investment project, and they have developed an elegant uh, tool that we, can be used by any organization working in remote patient monitoring. Primarily, at this point, it's designed to work with patients with uh, uh, patient populations with CHF or COPD. But it's a, an elegant tool that allows any group to look with proper data for internally at what the proposed or potential ROI will be for their uh, remote monitoring program before they get started and or as they're going along as a, a, a means to check on its progress. And it provides both an opportunity to uh, look at what will the return on investment will be immediately, but what's even more important is looking several years down the road. And that's where we have some interesting results from the work we've, we've done on the initial stages. And it also allows you to do scenario playing. So we, uh, and in fact, my one little pitch for the while here is that we are open to organizations who would like to use it. We're actually conducting a broader study um, of how that's, uh, of its impact so that we can aggregate data from across many different organizations. And again, of course, thanks to Margaret and the California Healthcare Foundation who have supported us wonderfully all the way along as this has been developed and being put out there. But some of the, very briefly, some of the results have been rather uh, astounding in terms of just the initial groups that we had involved in the program. We had five centers that varied from very large health systems to home health providers. Uh, and we saw successes in, not uh, success in terms of where their ROI would be, um, ranging from healthcare partners, a, uh, again, a, a large physician group practice a system that developed uh, an IVR uh, system and um, interactive voice response program that had very low cost up front, uh, modest ROI, but in the long term uh, was going to have up to uh, over a, fi a 15 to 1 ROI over the following years, to other programs such as the uh, Centura uh, Health at Home program, which is based in Colorado, that demonstrated that through their ability to uh, put together a program that used a call center and specific work within their RPM program that they could, they were going to gradually move to uh, a, a, from a, it was very modest first year because of all the startup issues and the, the t uh, technology expenses, modest ROI, but over several years we'd be moving up into a three to one, four to one ROI, which allowed their organization to say, we're gonna take this statewide. And I think that's what we get to in terms of what evidence do you need when you can take that back to senior management and uh, financial staff and show them here, here is where the, the return will be, particularly in the longer term from using a program of this nature. Um, Shri, quick question to you. Do you think ROI demonstrations are enough? And as both as an employer and as a provider, what other evidence do you think uh, is needed to, to 
to convince you or someone like you that this needs to be scaled? ROI is important. I would say ROI is table stakes, but insufficient. You have to also be able to show that many times you're working through a large complex organization to deploy these technologies. So can you help us go through those pain points that I had just talked about in my opening comments? That's important because you're entering into a partnership uh, with the provider or with the employer. I would say there's also some second, I would say cost and quality are also top of mind when we're looking at ROI analyses. There's some second order metrics which may or may not be measurable as you're thinking about your products. Uh, as an employer, we're also looking at uh, though this is a little bit more nebulous of a concept, but productivity and presenteeism, how can your products help us with that? Uh, and retention and satisfaction and, and limiting uh, employee turnover. So if there is a way to show that these products can help with creating your, uh, a sense that you're a, a great place to work, that helps. On the provider side, there's some other second order metrics which are around uh, leakage or patient engagement. So. Can your product, especially as PPO products, where you don't have to declare who your primary care uh, provider is, and there's free and open access, and that's very much that's what Medicare is, unless you're a Medicare Advantage product, um, having these types of technologies could make your provider system differentiated in the market. And uh, though that's a second order metric after cost and quality, those are things that uh, I'd be keen to look at if you had that kind of evidence. Great. Uh, Rajni, do you see any um, other points of evidence that, um, in your world that would be useful to prove out, or, or what other sort of things have you seen in your world uh, that have convinced you that this is a good idea to scale? So um, I think one of the things, we, we talked about remote patient monitorings, and when I, when I check the landscape and, and we look at it, we see what's emerging and what's coming in the marketplace. And one of the things or the trends that lately we have seen is the uh, sensors. So either, either wearable sensors or in our world, I think personally what's more important is the PERS, which mm -hmm. is the personal emergency response system. So when I think when we look at the technologies, you have to basically say who's the audience you're catering to and uh, what is the population need and serve. And it can be very different from an employer segment to a senior segment. And uh, when we look at it, we are primarily focused on how we're gonna keep you safe and healthy at home. And certainly I think from our perspective, PERS is a really very important uh, area that we are uh, ingrained in right now. Mm -hmm. And for us, it is more like uh, fall prevention, early detection, uh, Alzheimer's, dementia. I mean, we're looking at all these different components to say how we're gonna keep you healthy and safe. Mm -hmm. And uh, while we are doing this, can we integrate technology? Can we monitor you? And then also in the end, not only provide the quality that you talked about, but also decrease costs. So I think purse has become uh, more and more important for us. The other things that I see is when you look at the wearable technologies, what's gonna resonate with my patient or with my member? I mean, are they ready to wear a a, a bracelet on their wrist? Are they going to wear um, some neck uh, pendant? And I will tell you, I was at the ARP conference, I think, four or five months ago, and one of the feedback from the uh, user groups, or actually from the audience, was, that's not fashionable. I'm not going to wear it. So yes, it does many, many things that you're talking to me, and they're all very good for me, but they're not fashionable. Mm -hmm. So I think when people create, or when, when we look at new technologies or what's emerging, one of the things we look at is how, how feasible are they? I mean, are, are people feeling comfortable wearing it? Are they uh, fashionable enough that they can wear it? And plus, it's also serving the purpose that they're ultimately supposed to serve. And one of the interesting things, which I will share with everyone, but I don't know where that's going to go, but it's from a startup right now. Uh, it's like a wearable tape. Yeah, so it's just like you put it on your, on your wrist, it's a scent, uh, anywhere in your body, basically. Nobody even has to see it, that you're wearing it. And, uh, and it does a lot of great things. It checks your uh, heart rate, I mean, your respiration, your sleep patterns. I mean, so things are emerging in this market, and uh, I, I think we'll continue to monitor what will resonate within our environment mm -hmm. um, and what will resonate into the employer segment. Great. Um, what are the other areas that we're, we're seeing, uh, all of us here, um, that, that 
seem to be the maximum bang for our buck, like that are great opportunities for telehealth. Uh, we know remote monitoring for heart failure has been proven out. COPD is, is also a proven case almost. Um, what are the other opportunities? Purse is a great example, uh, Rajni. Um, as, an, as an investor market, what are you seeing? And then I would love to hear from everyone. Um, th so the, the remote monitoring uh, example that I can give that we're working most closely with now, and many of you have seen it out in the exhibit hall, is Propeller Health. We've been working with them with Dignity Health, a large Catholic healthcare system, uh, national system, and did a randomized controlled trial with the goal of, of scale. Obviously, mm -hmm. we put together the partnership with Dignity, hoping that if this could prove out successful in one of its sites, that it might scale throughout the system. And that is a, um, basically a remote monitoring system that works for both asthma and COPD. Um, and, and I think one of the most interesting things about it, apropos of Rajni's comment, is that it's what I think of as passive sensing. So it's a sensor that's sitting on an inhaler, but it's collecting information that historically we've always relied on people to remember, and we've known very definitively that people were not recalling that information accurately. And so this notion that you can have a, a sensor that is part of your work, your own personal workflow. I have to, t to use my inhaler. When I use it, this information is going to be collected and going to be uh, transmitted and then used uh, for information that can help me as the patient manage my condition or help my providers manage the condition, I think is a really important one. Um, and, and particularly, you know, in an area like COPD, which is such a high cost condition. Um, I think that the, the sensor tattoo, I agree, is, is really an interesting, uh, it gets around this problem of the wearing the bracelet, pushing a button, losing the thing that's magnetized that's clipping on to you somewhere um, and and collecting and, and being able to transmit this information. I think a really important function is having the information layer that takes this data and turns it into usable, elegant, comprehensible information um, for both patients and providers. I think in terms of other areas for, for you know, telehealth broadly, um, we're doing a lot of work with, uh, with specialty care. So a lot of the work with, for us with low-income populations is around helping people get access to dermatology, helping people get access to mental and behavioral health care, and really thinking about how to use technology to scale um, as, as massively as possible that access. So using images in the case of dermatology, in the case of mental and behavioral health, um, using peer support and online cognitive behavioral therapy. Uh, I think the populations we work with, th those are really hugely important areas. Uh, mm -hmm. Really thinking about how to um, get specialist knowledge and oversight and support out to remote either urban areas that don't have a lot of access to specialists or remote areas in the state where they're never going to be specialists and we're not flying them in. So mm -hmm. those are some areas we're looking at. Great. Shree? Yeah, I, when we look at where there's potential opportunity, if I talk to my colleagues across the country who are in the Pioneer Accountable Care Organization program with Medicare or any of my colleagues in Massachusetts who are within the alternative quality contract, all of us, as we concentrate on costs, are concentrating on the top 5% that account for a majority of our health care costs. And they have multiple chronic conditions. Uh, and so technologies that, and we're providing them care management support with nurses or uh, nurse extenders. But the more information that we can empower our care managers with, the more that we'll have an ability to better coordinate their care. So that is a population that uh, we're always quite keen on finding people who can empower our care management systems. Great. Uh, I'd like to just pick up on Shree's point because I think as we move forward, it, it's not necessarily, we'll see improvements in technology in a number of ways. And I think uh, obviously one of the key successes that we've heard here again and again through the symposium is the uh, advent of quantifiable self uh, technologies of mobile uh, sources to really advance this and make it much more not only portable, less expensive, but really bring data uh, to individuals. So, and I think it goes back to some of the things we were talking about earlier. What are some of the key points to be successful? So as we see ACOs and other groups uh, really looking at how to best maximize this, uh, we're, it's really going to be uh, adding those other more subtle elements rather than just the exact technology, just the exact um, uh, having a, a remote pro, uh, uh, patient monitoring program, it's going to be 
how you incre increasingly refine your care management, for example, using, uh, as we're talking about the 5% the of uh, uh, complex chronics that'll have to be managed, how you manage by exception so that your remote monitoring is refined, that you can pick up the, have information filtered so that it will come to the providers as to who are people immediately in need so that they, you can extend your staff to reach an ever greater population and identify those who really need it. Um, the data analytics behind it, that that can become far more robust and provide information not only to the care, um, care team, but to the patient and uh, themselves, uh, where I think we really can see some reverse uh, work in this area. And um, still think we have to go back and look at a key issue that is less technology, but it's uh, really the existing workforce processes, whether it's an ACO or an existing um, health system uh, that, like the many we looked at, it's looking very carefully at the internal work processes where you have the technology now uh, supporting it, not trying to create brand new systems, but how it can really maximize the existing uh, processes and be very uh, uh, flexible in terms of meeting the needs of uh, staff and how they actually do their work. Great. We have about nine minutes left, and I want to make sure that uh, we open it up to the audience. So if you guys have questions, there are mics on both sides, uh, and we're happy to take questions. Please. Hi. <coughs> My name is Lori Orlov, and I uh, track the technology market for older adults. And I wanted to make a comment about the PERS market, which is interestingly one of the longest standing, about 25, 30 year market of what you might think of as connected health or mobile health. However, only 10% of the devices that are marketed today are actually mobile, which is actually a big improvement over a couple of years ago. Uh, the big percentage of the users of them, which is targeted at an 82 year old woman living alone, wear the device for a couple years and then quit. And uh, almost none of the vendors, although this may start to change in the next couple years, actually aggregate the information about the pattern of usage to use it for predictive uh, information that might signal when, for example, the next fall or the next incident might be. Um, and I did want to mention that there is a beautiful watch made in Switzerland that is just coming into the U.S. from a company called Limex. I don't think anybody from Limex is here. But that watch is actually a Swiss watch. It looks great. It's a mobile purse, and it's been marketed in Switzerland by the uh, Red Cross. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, we'll take one from that side, please. Hi, uh, my name is Gaurav Singhal. I'm a medicine resident at Mass General. Um, I had a question for the panel about uh, sort of the ROI question. Obviously, we've heard about a lot of great technology at this session, not a lot of which has been scaled, and I think almost universally ROI demonstration is considered, as Sri pointed out, table stakes to sort of any sort of widespread adoption. A couple issues with that, I think, are that obviously in medicine we're dealing with subtle probabilities, and so some of the ROI, both clinical and financial, won't be seen for years, if not you know, up to a decade. Um, second, there's sort of a synergistic effect that happens once these technologies are integrated, sort of multiple technologies, not one alone, and providers become used to the workflow and integrate them with their care. So with these sort of activation energies and inertias, is there a way that we can get beyond sort of the demand for demonstrated short-term ROI in order to, you know, just start it, see how it goes, and, and see where that takes us? If I could jump in on that, uh, excellent points, and couldn't agree with you more. Um, and fundamentally, that's why we took on the ROI issue in terms of looking not just one year out, where uh, in some cases you may not show a positive ROI because of the, all the startup issues, the cost of equipment, the training, et cetera. But being able to really project out uh, with specifics about the uh, population you're going to be serving, the uh, what it's going to do in terms of staffing because you're going to be seeing changes in staffing. You're right, it's, there's a lot of synergistic issues that go on as time goes on. And that's why uh, we want to be able to look at those changes over a five-year period um, because it is not the short-term uh, response, which although many uh, healthcare organizations are very uh, cognizant of that, it's really thinking about where will they have to be three, four, five years out. But your, your point about um, 
other issues in terms of the, the synergy of how the, this program will work, I think really speaks to a key issue that we're now being challenged with in terms of how we build the evidence base. Uh, particularly as we have looked to the gold standard of doing RCTs and, and have seen some successes, some uh, lack of success, we're really reaching a point where we need to change the research paradigm. This is an area that I know that a lot of people at the symposium have been uh, thinking about, but it's how we deal with rapid uh, cycle evaluations. Many of the, uh, much of the work that we're seeing done in this space the, if you do it over more than a year, even uh, six months, you're seeing changes in the technology itself. You're seeing changes in uh, the populations that are being served. You have to, uh, see, and you see a great deal that comes from the clinical teams that they identify changes that could benefit the entire process, and that has to be accounted for as you move this forward so that you can uh, very quickly uh, make those changes, move, move ahead, identify other changes to, to, to get the maximum benefit here. So I, I would say from a provider perspective, we sign contracts that are one year to three years long. So, and there's a startup time. So it takes us six months to get off the ground and get this program into patients' hands. Uh, that's an ideal state. So it is important for us from a pro provider perspective, though we might be able to see a five-year ROI, uh, we're held accountable for costs if we're in an accountable care organization within one to three years. And even then, we know patients, if you're in a fee-for-service environment, patients are moving out of your uh, market service area fairly frequently. And so if it is a five-year ROI, are you deploying a technology that the competitor in another system might be getting. And so that's just economics that we have to deal with. Um, and then also on the employer side, you're looking at annual benefit spend budget. So you want to be able to show some benefit within a year or within the time that you have your employees, which can generally, if you look at NLB statistics, is about there you're getting to about five years of average tenure with large employers. Um, so it all, it really does come down to narrowing your patient focus to, and I think it is these complex chronic diseases or the top 5% who have multiple chronic illnesses because you're going to be able to show higher ROI if you're looking at the cost side of this than looking at the broad uh, health and wellness type of Fitbit, which I'm wearing right now, but you're not going to necessarily see that ROI within these contract periods. Great. Go ahead. Uh, hi, my name is uh, Pantelis Agelidis. Uh, we are technology providers. We, among other things, we have a remote patient monitoring platform. Uh, in the past two years, we were involved in. I'm not the only one, I guess. Yeah. <laughs> Better hold it. I'm not going to sing, though. <laughs> so, I was saying uh, we've been involved in a large scale uh, pilot uh, evaluation study for remote uh, monitoring that ran for two years across 10 different European countries. And uh, the results were uh, astounding, as you said, to use your word. And they're going to be published next month in various uh, um, scientific. Uh, uh, events. Um, but uh, as a side exercise, we also went out to see what other people were doing before this study. And we found a wealth of information of people doing more or less the same thing over and over again. And uh, we see that uh, happening now, I understand, in both sides of the pond. So what Humana is starting to do with EMC, probably other people have already done it. And organization after organization feel that they, they have to do, again, yet another pilot to prove probably the things that are already proven. So my question to the panel is, how much more evidence do you think we we're going to need until the time comes that these kind of services move out of the cocooning pilot in, and scale up into the real life uh, services. And do you think this is a problem of uh, information fragmentation or lack of trust among communities and organizations or, or what? Thank you. 
So hold that thought. I think this is a great question for a segue to closing remarks because I see our time is ending quickly. So I would request the panel to answer that question and then also give your closing remarks. And we're going to be here for the next 15 minutes. So if you guys want to ask questions, please come over and we can, we can talk. So um, I think one of the big things for us is patient engagement and, and how much uh, our members are, are utilizing technology and are adapting to technologies. So uh, when we think about providing services to our member, it's more for convenience, it's for, more for access, but it's also for them to, um, to actually provide these capabilities as a better monitoring of their care. And when we do these kinds of pilots, they, they reinforce our, our belief that um, um, providing chronic care management program through the use of technologies and utilizing our our health coaches or clinical team as their expertise builds an ecosystem that will think in, in long term or short term will help us with better results and better uh, provision of quality care. I will agree with you, um, a lot of other organizations have done similar pilots, but I think you do the learnings and then you have a plan to scale from it what you think will resonate or work within your organization. So it, it is a huge undertaking uh, for an organization as our size, and to see anything that works or for us to uh, forecast or foresee that we can scale this, we always start small and where we think is the actual need and um, where our people will be receptive to this kind of services. And once the adoptions and the results and the outcomes um, are measured, we think that then it's a, it's a good way to move into phase two or strategize that we can scale it into different environments or different markets um, within the United States. So. It's, it's a complex answer, it's never easy, and I don't think so that everybody has cracked the code on it, um, but these programs certainly work, and we are on our way to finding that success. And so we are on a journey, we are on a learning journey to find that. I think it's a great question, and <clears throat> and is this question of not invented here, you know, will we, will we get past that? I'm not a provider organization, so I'm not actually uh, making those decisions. I hope Sheree can speak to it uh, a little more directly. But what I will say is, to David's point about changing the research paradigm, I think our effort to get 100 organizations to work on this congestive heart failure ROI tool and exercise, a big part of that was to try to bring in a very broad, diverse range of organizations to get a little bit to the question you just asked, which is, are we are we going to be able to use something broadly across a broad range of organizations, or is this to kind of my, one of my early challenge uh, issues, is this such an issue of culture and workflow that the only way for organizations to adopt is to, um, is to, to try it and then try to make more rapid the scaling within their own organization. But I think it's a, a really fantastic question. We're making an effort to see if we can do something about the information fragmentation and get a broader group of organizations to look at one condition and look at the evidence and potentially make a decision about adopting more broadly. But I'd love to hear from my colleague uh, who's actually making these decisions about adoption and purchase. You know, for us, we've, we've started to move away from this notion of piloting and moving towards piloting to, with an intention to scale. And it takes as much work for us to pilot as it does for us to just pilot and then scale it up. So if the, we need to know, you know, we have to be able to look at this as a two, three year project and say, after this pilot, what will it take for us to scale it? Can we do it? And what's the ROI for the patient selection? And how quickly can we have our providers adopt this technology on the provider side of the house? Um, so the ROI question becomes very different when you're thinking about it as an intention to scale. Uh, but it has been helpful for us to then focus on very promising technologies, and we really are focusing on those that are in high cost, chronically complex, medically ill, uh, patient populations, that top 5%. That's where we see a lot of ROI. And also, our providers are asking for help with that population. So if they're asking for help and we can provide a technology to help them with that, the scale, scaling to, uh, for it, with the intention to scale becomes a much easier proposition for us. So. Uh, 
I just like to pick up on a few of the, the points in, in summary, and, and but a key one that strikes me, and that is, uh, that was a great question because, in some respects, we're really uh, we've been seeing the same thing year after year now. Uh, I've come to not only here at the symposium, but at other uh, meetings where we and Lori Orloff is the best to uh, challenge everyone, saying we've seen the piles, we hear it again and again. Why do we repeat it? Well, again. Uh, CEOs, senior members of different groups uh, s tend to not accept data from other organizations. They have to see it proven th themselves. They have to see it within their organization. Plus, as Sri said, we're seeing so many rapid changes in that environment. I posit that we've actually, we do have enough evidence that this succeeds, particularly in very large closed systems, but we do have seen it, that it's much more the issue of how it applies to individual organizations and how you can quickly see that, get that evidence. And that's why we think not only the ROI model uh, helps get people there quickly, but that you can really be thinking within your system uh, as to what those key pain points are, how it will affect and how it will ad address the needs of the very specific populations in your high cost areas. So I'd just like to leave it saying that I think that we do have the evidence, but it's now our challenge and how we disseminate that and really bring it to bear and allow organizations to understand it within their own context very quickly. This, this has been a great, great, great discussion. A uh, couple housekeeping uh, points before I let you guys go. Um, the one thing is we're going to continue the discussion about for a lot of these sessions online uh, on ghdonline.org. That's Global Health Delivery Network Online.org. Um, uh, many different panels are going to be discussed. It's virtual. You, anyone can participate. It's free. So I would encourage you guys to log on and check it out. Um, and some of us are going to wait outside behind this room if you guys want to continue the discussion. Great. Thank you so much.